Hello, Kristen, our sexy sexologist. How are you? Yeah, I see we both got our kind of um, <clears throat> sexy transparent shirts going on today. Although We're my hair is covering everything. <laughs> Take Here a look, please. <laughs> Let's get sexy. Oh, this is fun. I've been looking forward to this. Me too. Thank you for having me on again. Ah, oh, you are so welcome. How's life been treating you? Things are great. My partner and I just bought a house. We're in the process of getting all that taken care of. We close at the end of the month and I'm excited. I'm excited to finally have my own house and no screaming neighbors, no yeah. dogs barking above me. It'll be great. I love that. I'm super, super happy for you. Plus I'm doing it with an amazing man. You know, it's a great next step in our relationship. We've been together about two years now, so oh, I'm excited to take that step with him. It's so fresh. That's so beautiful. And look at you guys, like just rolling into life like this. These are huge steps. Yes, absolutely. And he's, he is an amazing man and I'm excited to take these steps with him. Wow. Absolutely. No hesitations here. Not at all. You got yourself a 12. I do. I really do. Like I, I grin ear to ear. We, we joke about hashtag forever honeymoon because we just, we do the things to really nurture our relationship and we are emotionally available for each other. And it is exactly what we both needed um, when we found each other. So this is so good. I love it. I love it. I love it. So we had lots of chats last time and I was yeah. like, oh, there's so much more that we can dive into. Um, what was, is there anything that you wanted to start off with today or should we just kind of jump into whatever, whatever? Well, I will let you know that May is national masturbation month here in the United States. So I don't know if you celebrate masturbation month in Canada as well, but, uh, there's a few countries out there that celebrate it this month. So just happy national masturbation month that that's what you choose to celebrate in May. I love this. And should we do anything special to celebrate this month? Well, I think that yes, one people should, I think often consider what is their relationship to solo sex? Do they have a healthy and vivacious solo sex practice? Because I, I come from a place of abundance. I don't think that we are limited on how much pleasure we can experience. And I know that sometimes when people are in coupleships, they tend to let the solo sex languish and focus just on partner time. However, if you're finding that your libido is languishing, you probably just need to nourish that desire within yourself. And solo sex is a great way to connect to your body. And they, they serve two very different purposes, solo and partnered sex. So maybe just take a look and see, are you, are you having a, a great solo sex life right now? And if not, maybe just have a conversation with yourself about what are some of the barriers? What are some of the hangouts mm -hmm. and what can you do to nurture that side of yourself? So this is an interesting link to make because I get a lot of questions about mismatched libidos. Mm -hmm. And usually it's the like, uh, more often than not, it's the person who has the higher libido complaining about the person who has the lower libido. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's an interesting connection to make between masturbation and a lower libido. And I'm seeing how, you know, maybe it's not so much a lower libido as sometimes it's, I just don't get so much pleasure from sex. And that's why I'm just not really into it because eh, why should I? And sometimes the reason why we don't get so much pleasure from sex is because we don't know what we like, because yeah. we never took the time to explore our own bodies and giving us the opportunity to teach someone else what it is we enjoy about ourselves. You hit the nail on the head there. Exactly. I think I like the saying that sex is perfectly natural, but it's not naturally perfect. It takes practice and the sad, crazy, weird part about female bodies, especially is that because of hormonal changes throughout the month and throughout our lives. So as we age, things change, things shift sometimes through the month, um, having your nipple stimulated feels great. And then other times it's quite tender and you don't want anyone to go near it. So our own bodies are confusing enough for us, let alone for our partners. So I think that, you know, solo time is one of the best ways to figure out what you want, what you need, not only compared to last week or last month or last year, but you know, you just, if you're not connecting with your own body, how can you possibly tell your partner 
how you like to be touched or where you want to be kissed yeah, or how fast you want things to go, like, all the things. Yeah. And I mean, I've been there myself. Like I didn't have an orgasm till I was 21. I really masturbated for the, I mean, on, yeah, I touched myself here and there, but I didn't know what to do or what I was doing. And I didn't actually masturbate um, until I was 21. And like, I, I gave myself a day, like I, I got the joy of sex. I took a luxurious shower. I mm-hmm. made it all about myself. Um, and when I found myself doing what people normally did to me, I stopped myself and I said, no, 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 no. That's not how this is going to go. I'm going to figure out my way. And I did. I love that. I love that. I don't think that I really started exploring masturbation until I was in college and I hadn't had a whole lot of sex by that point. So it was an interesting experience to just try out different things. And I also had not been exposed to very much pornography at that point yet. Uh, The internet was (laughs) still quite grainy during that time. And I wasn't going to go spend my money on renting DVDs at that time. Uh, So I I felt like I was just lost Mm. because I didn't have any, any guidance or any direction. So I just had to sort of figure things out. It was sort of like making bread without having a recipe, kind of just basically knew what went in, but you didn't know how to make things rise or, uh, but I eventually figured my way out once I was in my early twenties, I think. Don't you think that needs to change that? Like why, how is, is, how can we be adults and not know how to touch our own bodies? How can we change this? I think that a lot of deconstruction has to occur in our society. You know, I, a lot of conversation right now in the United States is surrounding the idea that sex education for children means that we are trying to groom them. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. We're actually trying to prevent sexual predators from grooming children. Um, I, I think that because there's so much sexualization about our body, that if we're even just talking about genitals or genitalia, then there's a sexualization of it. And I do think that early on, we need to accept a more um, biological view of sex. Yeah. Right. Not just a sexual view of sex. We have to understand that there are some functions to our, our genitals, our bodies and to sexuality that just need to be understood from a biological process standpoint, from a young age and from a safety standpoint. Yeah. So I think if we were able to adopt that in a lot more cultures, I mean, I don't know how it is in Canada, but I, I think European models are often much further ahead than other cultures yeah. uh, in trying to make sure that from a safety standpoint and a health standpoint, there's a lot more understanding at a young age. And when that is in place, it's a lot easier as people age to talk about things like what does a healthy relationship look like? Mm-hmm. What does healthy sexual exploration and safe exploration look like? Yeah. And that isn't about talking nitty gritty details with a 16 year old about BDSM, but it is maybe saying you need to understand what's safe and what consent means, how to give it, how to receive it. And you need to understand that it's okay to say no, you need to understand that it's okay to be into some things that maybe other people aren't into that can look like a really age appropriate conversation about that topic. Yeah. So I think that there just needs to be some education earlier and that there needs to be certainly less stigma against things that are considered uh, taboo. Yes. I mean, touching, being in control of our own bodies should not be taboo, but because it is, I have women who say I went on a date and he kissed me and I didn't want him to, but he just did. And because this woman doesn't have control over her own body, she didn't have enough control to push him away when he moved in for a kiss. And so I do think that this stigma of women being in control, touching our own bodies, having agency over our own bodies, puts us at a danger later on in life of being taken advantage of by people who will prey on our weakness. And I absolutely agree. When we are not strong, we are weak. So how can we let girls, young women, girls, teenagers, 
children even, like when does this come in? How do we teach them to have control and agency over their own bodies? We touched on something really important there with that agency factor, because oftentimes adult women who have a hard time saying no are women who, when they were younger, were basically taught that their no didn't mean anything. They weren't given autonomy or agency. So I do think it starts young with things like hugs and they don't have to hug somebody that they don't want to. They don't have to physically interact with anyone that they don't want to, whether it's sitting on Santa's lap or it's giving that weird uncle or that smelly aunt a hug at Christmas time. Because again, it's just, it's either giving them the ability to say no. And then having the conversation later about like, tell me more about what, what led you to say no. Like you can have those conversations certainly, but you need to let them know that their no will be, will be respected. Uh, I think it also comes up in teaching about enthusiastic consent, especially for teenagers, you know, that if she says no for a date, young man, that, do, that does not mean go try harder. That does not mean shower her with attention and romantic overtures. The way Kanye is going about trying to win back Kim is absolutely wrong. Right. We should, we should be respecting people's nose. Yeah. So I think that's a prime example in our media lately of uh, a woman whose no is not being respected. Mm-hmm. So, and she, per- she certainly has plenty of agency over her own body, but again, that, that young man was never taught, Hey, if she says no, you need to respect it. So, yeah. um, I think that those are two of the primary ways to teach young people about those things. So let's say we have, a we have a mom who's listening right now. She grew up getting zero sex ed at home. Um, she's found herself in positions where she didn't know how to say no to somebody. So she went with it, even though she didn't really want to. Now she's looking at her young daughter. Her daughter's 10 years old. What should we teach her about what to say at what stage to empower her daughter to be in charge of her own body? Good question. I think that when it comes to prepping parents for those uh, sex communication boundaries, relationship talks, there, there is a certain amount of checking in with their own stuff and unpacking some things and recognizing that I don't have to do things the way that they were done for me. I can certainly make better calls and have more in-depth conversations and give factual information to my child rather than either Oh my gosh. I remember one person saying that they were told as a teenager that if they kissed a boy, they would get pregnant. So then they didn't actually know how intercourse worked and they got pregnant. (sighs) Yeah. So they didn't kiss. They just had sex. Right. She thought she wasn't going to get pregnant. She didn't kiss him. That's real. Yeah. Um, So anyway, I think that parents had to prepare themselves for some of those conversations. And I, I think Yes, ages and stages, there's definitely resources and books out there, Planned Parenthood. Um, I think the Center for Sexual Education. Here, I've got a, uh, let's see, sexedconference.com. They've got lots of sexual, sexual health information. There's also a great book by Dr. Lene St. John called Read Me, and it's like a parental primer. Oh, precious. A parental primer for the talk. And it's really more of helping parents check in with themselves and that prep talk of like, okay, this is going to be awkward. Like take a deep breath and acknowledge it, acknowledge the awkwardness for yourself as well as your child. And then just move forward. But she talks about how like communication and fantasy are important for, for them to under, to know. And like, again, the, the healthy boundaries and things. Um, but yes, I think that checking in with themselves and understanding like what, what's going to feel the most awkward to talk about if you know there's things you can't talk about yourself, find those online resources. Yeah. Like scarletteen.com is one of the best resources for parents and adolescents. Yeah. The parent can go on and find a little article, maybe you send it to their child or they can look at it together. Um, they can also just introduce their adolescent to the website and say, why don't you have a look at this? Yeah. If there's things on here you have questions about, we can talk about them together. There's lots of great resources these days on the internet with 
factual sexual health information that help prepare parents. I, I like that idea of, you know, for the parent who's like uncomfortable with those kinds of conversations, because that's not where they came from, like an open and, and honest communication. And, you know, I, I want, I want to say to the parents out there, even if you never came from that and you're afraid of it, do it anyway. And don't mm-hmm. just hand over those articles, but read them over and, and try to have that discussion with your child. Um, as comfortable, uncomfortable as it may be, it is an opportunity for them to understand that you are okay with mm-hmm. sexuality and you, sh- you, you need to communicate that. I really do believe that you need to communicate that because Kristen, you and I both know uh, purity culture doesn't work. <laughs> it, it makes things worse. It like giving the impression taboo makes things sexy. So giving the impression that you want to pull them back from their sexuality makes it taboo, makes it sexier, makes them more likely to do more. When mm-hmm. you have open conversations about it, we find that educated teens make better decisions. So if you let them know that you support their healthy sexuality, and by healthy, I mean going at their pace and not being pressured to go beyond their pace and being in control of their own bodies and the pleasure of their bodies, um, when you support that, they tend to actually hold back a little bit because they feel like they are supported in holding back because they are empowered. And so they don't go at someone else's pace. They go at their pace. Absolutely. There have absolutely been some studies out there that support everything that you just said. There was actually a study that came out a few years ago that showed that young men, when they receive factual sexual health information from their parents, but specifically from their mothers, They are more likely to delay the first time that they have intercourse. They delay uh, the age at which they have their first child. And in the long term, they have healthier sexual health outcomes, meaning fewer STIs, uh, fewer uh, HIV um, positive statuses. They have less risky sexual behavior, meaning they'll they'll use protection. They have fewer partners. They don't participate in risky um, sexual patterns. Mm -hmm. So- moms, especially for your sons, it's okay to tell them like, Hey, when you are ready with your girlfriend, I see you all are totally in love. I'll get you condoms. In fact, here's some condoms that I've got, you know, reserved They're in the the back of the cabinet. If, when you need more, let me know. Yeah. You know, if you did did the, did the health class show you how to properly put on a condom. Okay. Let's find a video online that you can watch. And if you have questions, we'll talk about it. Get the banana. Get the banana. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the health teacher in my school when I was in eighth grade was fired for showing kids in health class how to put on a condom on a banana. Not okay. Not okay. That's in the mid nineties. Yeah. It was a huge deal here in Missouri. I, I still, I still think about to this day, poor Mrs. Huff that got fired for showing kids how to put on a condom. She was doing those kids. I hope those kids that were in that class remember that and know to this day how to properly put on a condom and know how to protect themselves. Yeah. I don't think parents should leave it to the schools for sex ed. Not entirely. I think that there's, there's the reproductive health that often comes in schools here. But when it comes to the harder conversations, again, the things about healthy boundaries, about cons. Consent, I think, can be had in the schools, but those those more intense conversations about, you know, how how is this this relationship that you have this girl or this boy, and checking in to make sure that it is healthy and their boundaries are being honored, um, and helping them actually understand what their boundaries are. Um, I think that conversation about when they should or shouldn't make their sexual debut, you know, having that conversation about what it takes to be mentally ready for that. You know, are you ready for the risk of having an STI? Are you ready for the risk of having an unwanted pregnancy? What would that look like for you and her? Have you had those conversations? Yeah. I talked to my little cousin about that one time when I found out he was having sex at a fairly young age, like 16. And I said, you know, if you're not ready to get that phone call that she's pregnant and what all the consequences are around that, 
you're not ready to have sex. Right. And he actually stopped having sex for a while until he was ready. Yeah. He I- had never had anyone give him that permission before though. It was all just so taboo and not spoken about. They weren't using protection. I said, I'm either going to go to the store and get you condoms or you need to have a conversation about what birth control is going to look like between you two and how you're going to get it. Yeah. So mm. it takes one adult in a lot of kids' co- lives to either help them feel comfortable with their sexuality and their identity or to help them know what sex actually is and how to protect themselves. Mm-hmm. They all just need one adult. Yes. Yes. For my sis, me it was my sister, right? Mm-hmm. I I was sixteen. Um, I had a boyfriend. We were getting, you know, it, it'd been like we've been together for a while, and uh, and I was getting, I was getting close to that point where I was like, I, like I was thinking about it. So I ended up going to my sister, asked her about her first time. Um, she took me to the doctor to go get birth control. So it is very important that a teenager has somebody they feel comfortable talking to. Um, and so it's, you know, I really find like the parent child relationship is so super important. I, I write my books with the intent of the parents having a healthy relationship with the child. And it's, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can imagine that sounds weird coming from me because I've admitted to my followers when I see people say, Oh, I'd love to have a kid. I'm like, I don't understand you at all. When people say it's the best thing that ever happened to me, I'm like, I don't understand you at mm-hmm. all. Same. I don't want children. I, I thought I wanted kids. I just want to be a nice auntie. Just that's all. I, that's, that's my role in life. Right. <laughs> but everything I do, I got the kids in mind. Like no more assholes is about choosing that parent. That's going to be a good partner, a good parent, a good role model. Fix that shit is all about having a conflict-free relationship. So that once again, you are good parents or good role models. And mm-hmm. I want parents to be able to have open, honest, easy conversations with their children. And I wrote dating 101 with two, four words, one to the parents or guardian and one to the teen who's reading it. And the purpose of this book, I've got two really. One is, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully one day it's in every high school because I'm just that famous that they want to take it and toss it in there because it's so oh, bad, yeah. right? I'm, I'm the voice of dating and relationships. I'm the voice of logic and reason in 2022 and hopefully yes. 2030. So um, I wrote Dating 101 with, with that purpose to get it into schools, get it into sex ed because it, it is sex ed and it, it needs to be said. What's in there, all of it needs to be said. Um, but for now, it's up to the parents. And I advise parents to read it first because I got some saucy stuff in there. Because again, it is sex ed. I talk about masturbation. I talk about setting the pace. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I want parents to read it and do date night with their kids and do the chapters together, read them together, have these conversations. And I am hoping that parents who have a difficult time having these conversations have an easier time with the book in hand, guiding the way, and they read it together. And then it's like, do you have any questions about this? Um, And then, you know, maybe the kids ask, what about your experience? And now we have this like open conversation between the parent and the child about what maybe should have been better in the parent's history. Like, I wish it was more like this. And so, because I wish mine was different, I'm helping you today because I want you to have a different outcome than I did. Lovely. That's some good vulnerability prompts there. Yeah. Right. That, cause I think that is what it takes is it is a bit of back and forth that you don't need to tell your child everything that happened in your sexual past. Cause not even your partner right. she needs to be privy to every detail of your sexual history. There's a difference between privacy and secrets. Mm-hmm. However, a bit of self-disclosure to your teen of, you know, my, my first time was super awkward. Um, here's the things that went really, really well and that I enjoyed. Here's what definitely could have been better. Um, you know, here's the conversations I wish my mom would have had with me about contraception and how to make that choice for myself. Like all of those things really, really matter. But again, you don't have to get into the nitty gritty details of your past to have a vulnerable, vulnerable conversation with your teens and help them see that like, okay, we can talk about these things. Cause again, if, if they can't talk about it with you, they will find someone to talk about it with. 
And that doesn't mean that they're going to get the factual sexual health information that they should. Yeah. Now let's hope like, if, it, if they go to the internet, there's some really great resources, yeah. but they might turn to porn for their sex education. Mm-hmm. We don't want that. <laughs> Unless it's directed by women. Yes. I'm a big <laughs> fan of, of Balesa because they have a lot of female directed porn and Yes. I like it. And the reason why we're talking about female directed porn versus male directed porn, um, I've, I've done eaten this and I read any article, um, done by a porn star I can come across, um, male directed porn is all about the, uh, you know, hard and fast. Whereas female directed porn is about the sensuality of it. Uh, the eroticism, the foreplay, the, you know, oh, the sexiness. So, yes. Yeah. So we do encourage people to dive into female directed porn if they want to introduce porn into their couplehood. Um, you know, even talking to your kids about porn, uh, they're going to find it. They're going to find it. But have that conversation where you say, you know, there's, there are different kinds. So you're probably going to come across the male directed stuff, but that stuff isn't focused on the female pleasure. Mm-hmm. And so if you are going to go look for this kind of stuff, you should understand the difference. And the ones that are directed towards the female pleasure have eroticism and foreplay into it. And the women's pleasure is taken into account. So keep that in mind yeah. when you're watching it. So yeah. Kristen, if a woman is saying, well, I've never masturbated. I've never touched my body. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Is there a book is where, where, where should she start? Actually? Yes. There, there is a book that I think is great. Even if she's had an orgasm before the exercises that come in the book called becoming orgasmic um, by, I think it's Julia Hyman and Joseph LaPiccolo, which I, it is funny that her name's Hyman and she wrote a book about becoming orgasmic, but it, it's a book for pre-orgasmic women typically, or, or maybe just someone who hasn't had a wonderful orgasm or wants to reconnect with their body. There are some exercises throughout this book that are things like, uh, what we call a mirror exercise where it's you're nude and you're in front of maybe a full length mirror, maybe in the mirror in front of your, your, uh, sink. But just observing your body and, you know, touching yourself and getting used to that, that can be a great start. And also trying to be neutral to your body, not saying negative things to your body, but at least saying neutral and kind things to yourself when you're looking at the mirror, things like looking at your vulva and getting used to what that looks like. A lot of people have never looked at their own vulva with a mirror, little hand mirror, and just like, let me just check it out. Yeah. Just check out your vulva, explore from, again, just a, a curiosity, you know, not trying to turn yourself on necessarily just explore what it, your folds and what your anatomy looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, it also has an exercise where you just do full body touch while laying on your bed. Just explore what, what do different sensations feel like when you touch hard or you touch soft, when you scratch, maybe you've got a feather or something soft to touch yourself with. And just explore what touch is like all over your body, but it's not focused on your genitals. Mm -hmm. Then you start evolving into more genital touch and touching yourself without the intent of orgasming, but just touching yourself to see what feels good. Yeah. It can involve a toy or not. Yes. A new toy can also be a great thing to add in there. So I, I think that becoming orgasmic is one of the best books out there for helping women learn to explore their bodies. Mm -hmm. and and take the time to make it romantic Mm -hmm. like get it get a space heater turn it on like warm that room up get Mm -hmm. or take a hot bath first get the get the soft glow going with like that one lamp going get the coconut oil to like Mm -hmm. your hands to even do that whole body touching do it with coconut oil like just so nice and smooth and slippy um get a candle going candle the incense put some new music on smoke a little bit of pot if you want hell yes you are two and a half, I'm sorry, you are two times more likely to orgasm if you have recently consumed cannabis. Is that right? Yes. 
I did not know that. There's I, not a ton of research about cannabis and sexuality, but I actually wrote about it in my column last month because it was 420. And I got to interview Ashley Manta, who also goes by the canisexual. And her whole mission in life is to help educate people about cannabis and human sexuality, the intersection of those two. That not only is it wonderful for its um, pain alleviation, um, any, any female body that's experienced pain during intercourse, THC or CBD lube are wonderful, but also the consumption of both of those can help your body relax enough to not only just not experience pain, but to actually experience more pleasure. I did not know that. Thank mm-hmm. you for educating me on that one. I didn't even know Absolutely. THC and CBD lube. That's amazing. <sighs> yeah. Foria Awaken is a wonderful coconut oil based CBD lube. I love it. Just put a little on your vulva or just inside Mm -hmm. uh, and let it sit for about five minutes. That's all it takes. It does not create any sort of a numbing sensation for your partner. Um, and coconut oil is great if you're using toys as well. hundred percent. I back coconut oil all the way. I've tried every single lube. There is coconut oil is the best organic cold press. Let's go. Does it, when you put this THC coconut oil, CBD coconut oil on your vagina, do you feel something on your vagina? The Foria, from what I recall, because it's been a couple months since I've used it. It's just a little bit of a warming effect, but it's not, there's not, it's not like a lidocaine that can definitely give you sort of a numbing sensation. Um, I, it just helps. It helps the, the tissues relax a little. So it's more of just like a <sighs> kind of effect than, you know, like if you put something on your gums, like lidocaine, it, it just numbs it. Mm-hmm. And, and there are definitely some things out there that are lidocaine based. Um, I don't think for vulvas that lidocaine is a great solution. Now I think for a penis, uh, an extending spray, that's got a light amount of a small amount of lidocaine, again, that they are applying to their penis five to 10 minutes before intercourse, cause it doesn't transfer. That's a good solution, but lidocaine is not a great solution for vulvas. Cause I mean, we don't already have many nerves inside of our vaginas as it is. So to numb them. That's, that doesn't do anything. And it doesn't actually relax the muscles the way that we want them to, to either reduce the pain or again, experience more pleasure. Mm-hmm. But it can give you a stronger orgasm. It can help you. I think that it's, it, it is a whole combination of effects in that it's the relaxation. It's, um, it's the getting out of our heads. It's the being able to relax more mm-hmm. um, because your brain is your biggest sex organ. Right. So I think that if you're consuming cannabis, either sublingually with an edible or smoking, um, you're getting some more of that relaxation benefit to where so a lot of women have trouble orgasming because they can't get out of their heads. Yes. I was, okay. you, you said our brain is our biggest organ and I, I wanted to add and our biggest distraction. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We're thinking about the to-do list or, oh crap, what are the kids doing downstairs? I hope they don't hear us. No, geez. You know, any number of things or the babysitter, you know, like it's going to be calling us in 20 minutes. It, there's always something going through our heads. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Cannabis can be something to help us relax that those voices going around in our heads. Oh, that's so sweet. So any last tips before we go, anything you want to add to anything we've said already? Hmm. You know, we did touch base briefly there on toys. Mm. And again, being masturbation month, yeah, toys are wonderful for solo sex, of course, but there's also a lot of couples that still don't integrate toys during coupled play time. So I guess my last bit of advice would be that it doesn't matter what your gender is. If one partner feels like toys should not be a part of coupled play time, I would simply challenge the couple to start exploring that a little bit more about like why. Is because that person got the message that they should be adequate enough, you know, that I should be able to pleasure you myself. Cause it's not just men that think that sometimes there's lesbian couples that also have this conversation too. Mm-hmm. Toys are a tool, right? You can put in a screw with a, a screwdriver and turn it by hand, or you can do it with a drill. Yeah. 
one just makes much quicker work of the same exact task. Yes. <laughs> and since women especially typically can be multi-orgasmic and can be quite insatiable once we get going, why not just bring a tool into the bedroom that can help you have one over and over and over and over and over again, instead of just having one or two or none at all. Yeah. Good point by you. And there are some new women's toys that are coming out. The one with the little sucky thing. Oh gosh. The air pulse technology one. So, cause they're typically, there are a couple, I think that sucked just a little bit, but most of them are actually blowing air out really fast. There's some amazing products out there. I'm hearing Absolutely. reviews. Uh, I got smile makers, the poet. It looks like a little flower. And it actually has adjustable heads for different sizes of clitoris because clitoris has come in different sizes. So there's like a small, medium, and a large. Uh, it, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> and I do also have a womanizer. Um, that one's intense. I'll just nice. Say that. Nice. Ladies, take some notes. Let's get masturbating. Yes. I absolutely. Love it. Oh, Kristen, you are amazing. I love having you on. Thank you so much. I love this. Um, Where can people find you? Thank you. Um, Well, they can find me. My website is openthedoorscoaching.com. And I'm also on TikTok. I'm at Coach Kristen. But most of my other handles like Twitter and Instagram are at OpenTheDoorsKC and Facebook's OpenTheDoorsCoaching. You can also find my podcast, which is just an audio podcast. I, I just never do the video. I don't know. I just, maybe I need to start doing that, but um, just an audio one that can be found on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts called keep them coming with open the doors coaching. Ooh, how do you spell coming? Oh, that's always what everyone asks. And I had to spell it normally just to get around the sensors. Ah, uh, yes. That makes sense. <laughs> that's so awesome. But I love puns and people usually, when they see that, they're like, ah, I like what you did there. <laughs> I like what you did there. Thank you so much for having me on you. You are delightful. I absolutely love your energy and your fashion sense. And if we ever meet in person, I'm absolutely raiding your closet. Oh, let's do it. Kristen, I love you too. You know, I do. You you. know, I do. You're as kindred souls right here. We love educating. We are intelligent. We are well-spoken. We are out here making a difference in shifting worlds. And I think yes. that's important. I, we, we need to all rise up and say, you know what, it's time for women to take their power because when women are empowered, so are men. Yes, absolutely. Right. Listen, now that I know how to orgasm, my husband knows how to get me off. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. We show them the way we show them the keys to our, our universe, right? I am the queen of my castle and my husband has the key to my kingdom. Perfect. Yes. Yay. I love you. Love I, you too. I'm going to have you back. We need to do some Please. more chats. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And my people love you. Oh, thank you. Thank you to all your listeners. I appreciate that. All right, my love. I'm going to talk to you soon. Okay. Have a good night. Bye.